A warm welcome to the video preview of the Abu Dhabi HSBC Golf Championship. My name's Ben Jacobs, the editor of Sports Talk. Alongside me, the tall frame of Robbie Greenfield, the editor of Golf Digest Middle East. Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy, and a number of other golfing giants, including Justin Rose, the American Jason Duffner, and three-time winner Martin Keimer, are all playing between the 17th and the 20th of January. On the 19th of January, the Saturday if you wear Tiger Woods red you get in for free so an epic fail on my behalf and Robbie's as well but Robbie on a serious note this tournament rightly deserves its billing as a Middle East major it really does it's got everything other than the, the title of world golf championship Ben it's got eight out of the ten top players in the world last year another fantastic field this year spearheaded by the two biggest names in the sport Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy who while well, last year they hadn't played together in the same group, it was the first time they'd done so on the national course. This year there's a semblance of a rivalry developing that we're all very excited about. So, many big names, but as Robbie alludes to, the focus on one Rory McIlroy and of course Tiger Woods, the former world number one. Let's start though with the man who currently tops golf's rankings, Rory McIlroy. He's got a superb record here, second last year, the year before that, the runner up as well to Martin Keimer and once more with Martin Keimer winning it the year before that one, third place. So he has to start not just because of his world ranking and form in 2012, but his record too here in the UAE capital as one of the favourites. Absolutely one of the favourites, obviously clear world number one, playing some fantastic golf the way we, he finished last year at the DP World Tour Championship, pretty much summed up his 2012 and obviously there's going to be a little bit of an adjustment there with his new clubs, his Nike clubs that he's literally just acquired and had a, the off season to practice with and that's the variable at the moment, we don't quite know how that transition is going to play. Now, speaking of Rory's clubs, a little birdie tells me that you went down to the Butch Harmon School of Golf at the Els Club and not only saw them, but had the nerve to take them out and have a swing. Well, I'm an opportunist, Ben. Uh, I, I happened to see a, a rather familiar or unfamiliar looking black Nike bag propped up in the Butch Harmon School of Golf office. And lo and behold, there was the putter that was used to win the US PGA Championship. It would have been rude not to at least take it out and have a, a couple of practice strokes he'd never seen a claw grip before but uh yeah they they look pretty good those new clubs he's got the covert driver in play the the new nike red driver nike blades and uh, a prototype putter alongside his scotty cameron putter that he used to win the uspga we're not quite sure which one of those he's going to put in play yet but um it'll be an interesting period for rory but i'm sure he's got the talent and the ability to overcome any kind of difficulties with the uh, transition well, it was the worst kept secret in golf during the off-season. Rory McIlroy joining Nike for a reported 250 million. Quite an astonishing fee in dollars, of course, that particular currency. It was announced officially at the Fairmont Hotel here in Abu Dhabi. And here is what the world number one had to say. Um, I'll start off with the, the VRS covert driver. Um, it's a little different, which I like from the start. It's red uh, for a start. Obviously, has the you know the, the cavity back, uh, which is a you know a, a new design in the world of golf. Um, and you know, as soon as I hit it, I knew that it was uh, it was going in the bag straight away. It was. I mean, it just blew me away. You know, my ball speed was up. My numbers were good. Spin rates. You know, and I'm hitting it further. So, you know, I, I thought I hit it far before, but you know, this is maybe taking it to a new level. So that's great. You've been preparing with your new Nike clubs at the Els Club, the Butch Harmon School of Golf. Could you just talk a little bit about your pre-season and how you've adapted to everything in the bag and the ball as well? Yeah, um, you know, I've been testing the whole way, you know, through Christmas and, and obviously been in Dubai in the, in the last week. And, uh, you know, everything's been great. You know, I feel like I'm hitting the ball really well. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I think the you know the change to the new equipment has been has been seamless you know i'm really happy with everything um you know and i haven't really spoke about the ball the ball has been fantastic you know i think it's it's you know this resin core technology um you know you've been able to you know hit your ball in the wind and be you know it stays so stable you know so i'm really happy with that i think that's something that will hopefully help me uh, in the wind uh, this year and you know i'm just really excited to, to start the 2013 campaign as a, as a Nike athlete 
So that was the world number one Rory McIlroy playing alongside Tiger Woods here in Abu Dhabi. They are now stable mates as well. Robbie, the rivalry between Tiger and Rory has always been quite friendly. Now they're both with Nike and are surely likely to finally partner each other at the business end of the major. Are we going to see a bit more bite to their relationship on the fairways? Well, we've been talking about their rivalry for the best part of a year now. They've only actually clashed once in a big tournament. That was the Honda Classic back in March of last year, where Rory pipped Tiger by a stroke despite a final round 62 from Woods. They haven't really bumped heads in a major yet. We're all waiting and speculating that that could happen in 2013. They're very good friends. They've got a lot of mutual respect for one another. They're now stablemates, which will bring them slightly closer together, and I'm sure they'll be paired together in more tournaments. But I think until they actually clash in a major, we're not going to see a real rivalry develop and it would be great to see a kind of Nicholas Tom Watson rivalry develop between those two. Well Tiger Woods has got a very good record in season openers he won the Farmers Insurance Open at Torrey Pines six times last year on his Abu Dhabi debut he led going into the final round could only card a level par 72 though and what that meant is Robert Rock came from nowhere with a two under 70 and played the role of almost a gritty party pooper not many men can go away and say I beat Tiger in the final round when he led there's only about nine in history absolutely Tiger's legendary at closing out tournaments his record when he's had the lead going into the final round is is unbelievable really and it was it was strange to see someone as unheralded as Robert Rock it's quite comfortably actually beat him in the end it was a subdued performance from Tiger Woods but I think what you've got to remember is 12 months ago he was still in that transitory phase where he was bedding in the new swing with Sean Foley his short game wasn't as sharp as it is now he's obviously got three wins on the US PGA Tour under his belt between then and now so he's a different proposition this year obviously likes the course it sets up well for him so I'm sure we'll see his name at the top of the leaderboard at some stage this week well, let's hear from the 14-time major winner, Tiger Woods, now. These were his thoughts ahead of the tournament, speaking at his official press conference. It felt good. It felt good to be back out there again. Uh, I took a little time off, got away from it for a little bit, and then uh, started gearing up for this week. And uh, it uh, certainly feels good to be back out there and, um, you know, in uh, more of a competitive mode than, than going out there and obviously playing at home uh, a lot of the holes. Right. Tiger, the European team captain could well be announced tonight and Rory has said quite vocally he thinks captains should only get one chance. Having endorsed Tom Watson from an American point of view, are those comments you disagree with? Well, Tony Jacklin did alright, didn't he? And Bernard Geller? They, I don't know, did, did they do okay? Okay, well, they, they had him more than once. So, um, it, it, you know, I, I don't know what the European tour um, matrix is. Um, we've certainly have, have gone outside of our, our matrix model that we've used over the years uh, with Tom. Um, it's usually guys in their 40s uh, or in early 50s or who've won a major championship and were basically on the back end of their career. Um, the European model's been, been different you know, over the years and it um, depends what the committee wants to do. That was Tiger Woods there. This national golf course certainly seems suited to his game. The same can be said for Rory McIlroy as well. Don't forget, as we mentioned earlier, three-time winner Martin Keimer and also the two-time champion Paul Casey here as well. So quite a few players starting their season on a course that does seem conducive to their particular games. Now, Robbie, we'll look at the 17th and 18th, two fantastic closing holes in a bit of detail very shortly. But what about the rest of the course what are going to be some of the key holes the beauty of the national course is it's a very straightforward course there's no quirks there's no tricks what you see is what you get with it it's just a long demanding championship golf course the rough is up I think they've grown up slightly more this year which will be perhaps pushing those scores down a little bit lower but the scoring here has been fantastic in past years Martin Kamer reaching 24 under par Paul Casey doing something similar so really it's a, it's a course that can be got at there's a very difficult stretch on the front nine between the fifth and the ninth hole with some very long par fours and a difficult par three into the win the seventh hole there's some scoring opportunities at the start of the back nine and then it all gets on a sort of hang on to the seat of your pants time from 16 onwards and uh, I think we're going to have a little look at 17 and 18 but 16 as well is a very demanding dog leg left par four yeah, speaking of 17 and 18, the final two holes, Robbie went out on the fairways here in Abu Dhabi alongside him. Danny Jakubowski, the director of instruction at Abu Dhabi Golf Club, they had a look in a little bit more detail at the final two holes. Okay, 
we're here on the 17th tee at the national course at Abu Dhabi Golf Club for the decisive penultimate hole of this Abu Dhabi HSBC Golf Championship. It's a treacherous par four, 483 yards in length, a dogleg right where the players have to carry a, a, a significant shot over the water, often into a prevailing wind, and then set up an approach shot to the green, which you see over on the right-hand side by these grandstands. Now, I'm joined by Danny Jakubowski, the Director of Instruction here at Abu Dhabi Golf Club. Danny, what's the pro strategy on a hole like this? It's obviously a very daunting hole, but, you know, coming down the stretch, things are tense and they need to make a four or maybe even a birdie. What's the strategy here? Well, Robbie, thanks. The, the first thing that the guys really need to do is they need to make sure that they hit the fairway. The rough's going to be long, um, so they're not going to be able to fire shots to the green if they miss that fairway. Look for most golf professionals here to start the ball just slightly right of that left-hand fairway trap and maybe even just slide that ball a little bit with the wind. That'll get them on the fairway and that gives them the opportunity to hit the green. Okay, and obviously not a hole that you would usually expect to birdie. It's 483 yards, it's a long par four. The wind plays a big factor, but Danny, mm. if you had to make a birdie, if you're a pro here and they're standing on this back tee facing this daunting tee shot, what's your strategy? <laughs> well, there's a certain physicality that most golf pros have and they can certainly get an extra 20 yards if they need it. Now, providing that the wind is friendly and not too strong, they may go further to the right and maybe even draw the ball and shave off maybe 20 yards. If they can get an extra 20 yards closer to that green, they'll be able to fire at a pin no matter where it is. So that may give them a good opportunity. Okay, it's, it's a tricky green, it's a wide green. We're going to head up there now, take a look at some of the shots that these pros might face around the green. Okay, so we're here up at the green on 17 in some fairly brutal, treacherous and downright thick rough really. Now, at 483 yards in length, not every pro, even though these are some of the best players in the world, is going to be able to hit the green in regulation. And to rescue their par, they're going to need to somehow dig the ball from out of this horrible lie that you get when you miss the green here at the national course with the rough this high and somehow play an accurate chip shot and ensure that they can still save their par. So we're going to head to Danny now who's going to explain precisely how these guys are going to extricate the ball from the rough in a controlled manner using two different techniques. Okay, the first shot that the pros will need to play is when the flag is a little bit closer to the edge of the green and they're going to need more height and they're going to need the ball to finish a little bit softer than normal. So typically what these guys will do is they will take the face of their golf club, which will be the highest lofted golf club. They'll turn it a little bit to the right and that will stop the club twisting when it hits the grass. Now typically, and, and the variations of this technique depend on uh, certain players and certain coaches, but typically you'll find they'll play this like a bunker shot. They'll make a relatively long swing and they'll probably make a quite a long follow through also. And it's going to look something like this. Okay, the second shot is when there's not such a premium on height and trajectory and ultimately the golfer will have a little bit more green to work with, meaning the flag is, is further away. Now, typically this shot has a lot more margin for error, so unless the guys have to flop that ball up in the air, they'll more than likely play this shot. Here's how I like to do it. I'll take the ball and I'll play it further back in my stance. That means that my club will be coming down steeper, which means that hopefully some of this knee-high grass will be out of the way. Then I'll kind of chop down a little bit more, and I really want to make sure that I'm popping this ball out. Come out lower, and it'll also run a little bit further. And it looks something like that. We're standing on the back tee box of the 18th hole, the final hole on the national course for the Abu Dhabi HSBC Golf Championship. It will all come down to this moment on Sunday afternoon where a player steps up with the lead or tied for the lead and they have to do something heroic on the final hole. And it's by no means an easy hole to pull off such a feat. It's 567 yards, dog leg right. It kind of slides round to the right, par five with a very deep green and Danny, a tough tee shot, isn't it? Certainly under the pressure, you've got trees on the right-hand side, fairway bunkers to contend with, and really, for these big players, they're going to be looking to make a four here. Look, I think, Robbie, when it comes down to it, they are going to have to make a four, and, and a lot of it, again, is, is dictated by the wind. Um, 
You have to hit the fairway and it has to be long if you've got any chance of hitting the green in two shots. The other interesting thing to note about this tee shot is if you hit the ball left in the rough, you're going to be struggling to get yourself into an opportunity to hit a good approach shot because the grass is that long that you may not get far enough to have a short iron to the green. We've seen some dramatic tee shots over the years, notably Robert Rock last year, yeah. ending up in, in the rockery appropriately yeah. enough down on the right hand side and he actually managed to salvage a six. He had a cushion at the time but this is a hole where it can all go wrong. It can um, and more than likely will for some golfers. Uh, I think that in reality we're going to see a, a very tight finish that's going to come all the way down to this tee shot. Well the interesting thing about this hole is often the approach shot. Not, not everyone can actually make it up in two so we're going to go up to around about 60 yards short of this very deep green and have a look at some of the pitches that will really determine the Abu Dhabi HSBC Golf Championship. Right, we're standing on the 18th fairway, just about 50 yards short of this very long and deep green. And this is where it will all come down to the crux on Sunday afternoon at the Abu Dhabi HSBC Golf Championship. And behind this wonderful scene of the iconic Falcon Clubhouse, these tremendous corporate hospitality pavilions that you see behind, which will be rammed full of spectators coming to crown a new Abu Dhabi HSBC golf champion on Sunday, the 20th of January. Now, Danny, the difficulty here with the players, because most of them will lay up, it will take a huge drive, of course, to set up a chance to go for the green in two. But if you lay up about 50 yards short of this green, just short of these bunkers here, because it's such a long green, it could be anything from 100 yards to, to 60 yards. Correct. Yeah, the, the, the big thing here is the pros, this is where their caddies come into play because these pros, they know their numbers. And this is all about playing the number. Uh, once they get their number in and they're factored in any wind or pin position, it's a matter of choosing the club, choosing the swing, and most importantly, really committing to the swing. Well, luckily, we have a man who knows his numbers as well. His name is Danny Jakubowski, and he's going to demonstrate two different type of pitch shots that you may see on Sunday afternoon here at the National Course. OK, guys, what we're looking at here is essentially two different pin positions. The first pin position is going to be at the front of the green. Now, remember, this, uh, this green is 50 yards deep. So the first shot is going to be around 55 yards. Now my full swing with my sand iron goes about 100, 110 yards. So quite simply, what they'll be looking to do is make a half swing, and let's see how we go. Now making sure that we control the trajectory and nose and belly button faces the target on the follow through. And that's that. Okay, so now we're going to play the second pin position, which is now essentially at the back of the green. As I mentioned, this green is quite deep from front to back. So if that was a 55 to 60 yard shot, we're now looking at around 110 yards. So I've selected my pitching wedge, and I'm just going to go ahead and make a nice, smooth swing. You'll probably see my club get up to about shoulder height. Again, like any good pitch shot, we want good tempo. We want to make sure that our nose and belly button's facing the target on the follow through. And there we have it, that's all the way up the back. Well, you know what, Danny, looking at those two shots, I'm starting to wonder why you're not out there competing yourself this week. Uh, those were the last two holes here at the National Course. The 17th, a daunting, treacherous 484-yard par four, sure to provide plenty of problems for the players come tournament week. And here, the 18th, this iconic 18th, Behind us, the Falcon Clubhouse that's become such a recognisable landmark in Middle East and golf. And before we go, Danny, I've got to ask for your prediction. I'm going to wait until I hear what Ben has to say before I make any predictions of my own because I want to canvas opinion. But who's your money on? Look, emotionally, I'm going to say one of the Australian contingent. But I think the smart money would have to be on the form players. I'm going to throw in maybe a Justin Rose. I think Justin Rose is in good form. He's a great golfer. Um, and I'm sure he's pretty handy with those pitch shots as well. Well, it's his debut here this month, but let's see if the world number four can walk away with the Falcon Trophy at the end of this week. That's all from myself, Robbie Greenfield and Danny Jakubowski. Thank you. 
So that was Robbie out on the fairways alongside Danny Jakubowski, the director of instruction here at Abu Dhabi Golf Club, and more importantly, one of the only few men that is smaller than me. Well, I think that's debatable, Ben. I think we'd have to stand you together and uh, then we'd really know. All right, pipe down you. Now, prediction time. We all know that Rory and Tiger are amongst the favourites, so I'm going to forbid you from plunging for either. What I want is an out-and-out -out winner and then a name who you think may just contend a dark horse who's going to finish on the leaderboard. Well, look, even if you offered me Rory and Tiger, I'd give you the same name. I'm a firm believer in horses for courses, and that's why I'm going to go for the three-time winner and Ryder Cup hero, Martin Kamer. Shocking choice. Now, it's not. Before you scoff, I know he missed the cut last year, but he's won here three times. Of course, that's going to bring a lot of confidence in itself, but the putt, the win late last year, Martin Kamer's fortunes are on the upswing, and that's why I'm going to go for him to add a fourth Falcon trophy to his cabinet by the end of this week. For a dark horse, I'm going to persist with a name that I mentioned at the DP World Tour Championship, and that is the Middle East specialist Henrik Stenson, a powerful player who, when he gets on a roll, is really unstoppable. So I'm going to go for those two. I'm going to ask for your predictions, an out-and-out -out winner and a dark horse pick, and I think everyone is going to see how badly you fare against my insightful picks. Henrik Stenson, the most erratic golfer on the planet, is somebody that you've plunged for. If a Swede is going to be anywhere near, it's going to be Peter Hansen, second in the race to Dubai rankings last year. Solid season, really great in the Ryder Cup, can hold his own with anyone. Putting has massively improved, as has his short game, particularly the sand save percentage, and I think he is going to be right up there. The dark horse, and I'm not even sure whether you can call him that because this could be a breakthrough year for Torbjörn Olsen, who is very highly sought after at the moment in terms of sponsors. Nike have just signed him. Many in the game think this guy is going places. He's more powerful than another prodigious young talent, the ADTA ambassador, Matteo Manassaro. Again, his putting has improved as well, and I think that he could be right up there. So those are our, if you like, four predictions. Mine, once again, is Peter Hansen, and alongside him, Torbjörn Olsen. Robbie, remind us of your two. It's Martin Keimer to win the Dark Horses. Henrik Stenson. If you disagree, you can tweet us. All of Robbie's 150 or so followers can be found at at Rob underscore Greenfield. My 12,000, I repeat, 12,000 followers are at Jacobs Ben. And if you want to find out more about some of the things our respective magazines do or follow us throughout the tournament, you can go to Golf Digest Facebook page, facebook.com slash Golf Digest ME. You can also follow Sports Talk via facebook.com slash ME Sports Talk. That's all we've got time for. Once again, a reminder, the tournament runs between the 17th and the 20th of January here at Aberdeen. Dhabi Golf Club on the Saturday the 19th. If you wear Tiger Woods red, you get in for free. Do continue to let us know your thoughts. And from myself, Ben Jacobs, the editor of Sports Talk, and Robbie Greenfield, the editor of Golf Digest Middle East. Enjoy the tournament and goodbye.